Welcome everyone to another Wo Lang Wednesday. I'm glad to have you here because we're going to do something that I love to talk about. I know I love to talk about all my topics. Guess what? I get to pick them. Isn't that the best part? So this one in particular is something that's going to make your life a lot easier because it's about what we always talk about, which is proficiency centered daily strategies and curriculum. But this class today is to make sure that you have strategies in your everyday planning routine to make proficiency that much easier to get to. So are you ready? You don't need anything for class except yourself today. So let's jump right in. Welcome. If you are new around these parts, my name is Devin and I am the teacher author behind La Libre Language Learning, if you teach French, or La Libre Language Learning, if you teach Spanish. I've taught both in my career, but now full time, I do classes like this. I help teachers create their own DIY curriculums and I also create curriculum materials for teachers like you who are trying to transition to proficiency, who've got a little bit of this that they're working with, a little bit of that, and they're trying to figure out how to put it all together in a way that's not going to cost them a lot of time and energy. So you ready for today's class? I know you are. Let me know where you are watching from and I'm gonna test here just to see that all of my techity tech tech is working correctly. So if you hear a little bit of feedback, that's just me being a creeper on myself. Looks like we're good. All right, so I'm gonna jump on in here then and share my screen. So y'all let me know in the comments as well to make sure that this is working correctly. Let's jump on in over here. Y'all, I'm hot. Does my face look red in the camera? I just finished a run and I, and I live in Charleston and I did not <laughs> anticipate how hot it was gonna be out today. And I am woo, still sweating from it, still sweating. I was not ready for that. I was not ready for it. Okay. Chrome, chrome. Oh, no. We don't want it to go to Facebook. I want it to go to my Canva. By the way, if you haven't seen me do one of these, I use all of the time my Canva account in order to share presentations. It is my absolute favorite tool. What am I sharing here? Hold on. That's not what I wanted to share. I was talking and sharing at the same time. I wanna show this, yay. Okay, so let's check and see if that worked. How we doing, how we doing? Hi y'all, welcome to class. Can you tell me if everything is working here? Can you see my Canva screen? Good, all right, all right. All right, so let's jump in here. This over here, by the way, what you're seeing is this is where you can, you can do all kinds of cool stuff in here. You can do all these templates so that you're, you don't ever have to spend time working on any kind of presentation template again in your life. It's awesome. All right, so let's jump right into planning for proficiency because I want to make sure that we keep this class short and sweet because we got things to do. All right, let's jump on in. If you are watching live, let me know where you are watching from today. So I'm in Charleston and I am blazing saddles over here. Sweating my buns off. Where are y'all at? Where are you watching from? And if you are on the replay live, welcome. Happy to have you. This is what feels like one of many of the spring curriculum series that I do every Wednesday this spring. I decided to do something different where I would teach classes that were in succession about a specific topic so that we could dive really deep into it. So this is curriculum and I'm gonna go ahead and drop some news on you that the next series is all about how to get started with CI, exactly how I did it. So. Get ready for that one. But after we're done the spring curriculum series, which ends about mid-June, we're gonna jump into something real juicy. But we of course need to have curriculum really lined up and well aligned in order to get to anything with CI because that's gonna make your life a lot easier. Speaking of that, today's class is all about planning for proficiency. What are the ways that you can really insert proficiency methods into what you're already doing so that it's easier for you to transition to CI? Because I don't know about you, but it took me way too long to do that. It takes forever and it feels like so much work. And I transitioned to proficiency like transition to proficiency. I never really fully got there, but I got as close as I could possibly get in a, I don't even know if you could semi call it traditional teaching 
area, not really, because we were all transitioning to proficiency, but I was probably, I was more proactive, I would say, than other teachers in my district and in my area. It's still a very new idea around where I teach, which was public high schools in South Carolina. So I was a French and Spanish teacher, but now I create curriculum full time and I do curriculum consultations and I help teachers create their own. So that's why I love doing classes with you to help make sure that you didn't have, don't have as much struggle as I did trying to fit the pieces of your curriculum together while trying to transition to proficiency because it's hard. So, and that's why I also offer these live classes every Wednesday, which are forever free and very forever at your disposal so that you can learn some things. So come hang out with me because it's more fun when I got buddies. So I'm so glad that you are joining. Stephanie, you're in the nineties in Maine? No way. It's like one of the three months where it actually gets to the nineties in Maine, right? That's wild. That's absolutely wild. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy it for a little bit. That's nice. Okay. So as a teacher and as a teacher author who presents, we all kind of start wriggling into a space that we love to teach about and that we personally feel that teachers will benefit the most from. And honestly, all of these things that I've listed here are equally as important and will equally help you on your journey to becoming a better teacher than you already are, because you're already a great teacher. I know that because you're here, but all of us kind of lean towards different things. I personally lean towards curriculum because I love it and because it, I'm something I'm, it's something I'm good at, but because I do think that it will get you to your desired goal faster and allow you to focus in on what you actually like about teaching. But I decided to create a very large portion of my summer PD offerings, like things like this. And if you've been around for a little bit, or if you're new to the blog, you're gonna be really excited to hear this. Um, one of my favorite projects is I am the host of Practical and Comprehensible, which is a conference designed to make sure that you've got everything that you need to transition for proficiency in a way that's actually practical, makes sense for your classroom and whatever classroom situation you are in. So we did this for the first time in January with over 20 amazing speakers who showed us real life, real time ideas that they were using in their classrooms to deal with the hellish situations of everything going on with pandemic teaching and all the different demands that were happening. And so now that we're doing it again in the summer and I'm finalizing the speaker lineup, I have a lot of amazing speakers lined up for you. So make sure you save the date, write it down. Pause, pause right now. Make sure you write it down. July 19th through the 21st, I'm hosting it again. It's gonna be awesome. We had 2000 teachers last time, more than that. And I know that we're gonna break the barrier on that again. It's gonna be awesome. And it's completely free. So make sure that you show up. Point of the story being is that I asked teachers this time around, what are you hoping to get out of this conference? Last time, the goal was to try and get you through a really muddlesome year. Now, as we're wrapping up this very muddlesome year and you're starting to think about what next? Like what now, what am I gonna do with the, the broken pieces that I have to put together from everything this year? This is what people said. So. A lot of it is what you would imagine, right? Everybody wants first week plans, classroom management, but actually the number one response was curriculum and year planning. That's what people would like the most help with. 85 teachers said, I would like some help with curriculum and how to plan my year. So I thought, well, we gotta make sure that we cover that then. And so you can count that when you come and join me for that conference, registration is opening up soon at the beginning of June. So make sure that you're on my email list so that you know when it's coming out. You'll get topics on all of these things, but we're especially gonna hit hard curriculum and year planning to make sure that you've got your year ready to go. Now, since we've got these things, rolling, rolling, rolling. Oh, I'm sweating, if not, oh my gosh. It wasn't even that long of a run, oh my gosh. Ooh, sweating. So set your intention and your action plan. You've only got a little bit of time on your hands now less than ever. So what are you going to get out of our time together? You are here to learn about planning for proficiency. What I'm going to ask you at the end of this class, what are you going to do this week? If it's only one thing. And I would even go further to say, 
what will you focus on as you think about next year, even if it's only one thing? Because a lot of the things that we talk about, you can start planting seeds this year, but it's very much intention to be that as you are sitting in meetings planning for next year, as you're reflecting on what you want things to look like next year, this is to help set you up so that you're not running into that constant roadblock that we have as transitioning to CI methods teachers of this is just too hard and this is going to take too much time. We're going to address that today. That's why this is all about planning for proficiency. So here's the focus of class today. What is the easiest, low energy, low prep way to be more proficiency oriented? Do you have any thoughts on this? What do you think? When you hear that question, how does that make you feel? To me, I breathe a sigh of relief. You know why? And tell me in the comments below, how does that make you feel when you read that question? What's the easiest, low energy, low prep way to be more proficiency oriented? This gets asked all the time. This is the focus of lots of PD, not just the stuff that I teach, but lots of other capable teachers talk about as well. You'll see many of them at Practical and Comprehensible. This is the real question. If proficiency is better and everybody is talking about it and everybody's trying to get there, why does it feel so friggin' hard? And I'm, I live in Charleston, but I'm originally from Philly. So I have, I have sailor's language. So every time I hear that question, it makes me want to curse. But how, why is it so hard? Why does it feel so hard if it's supposed to be better? Because honestly, it shouldn't be that hard. It really shouldn't be that hard. It took me a full year, maybe a year and a half to really change the way that I taught. And it shouldn't. Now that I know what I know about proficiency style teaching, if I could do it all over again, and that's why I love to do things like this, is that I hope that you don't have to go through the same things that I did. This is why proficiency feels so hard right now. And like, this is just the surface level, right? Because I'm not in the classroom right now. So I can't even imagine what you're going through. Like this is already just the surface tension, not to mention all the other things and stresses that you have from the year that you've already experienced. But this is just what's on the surface and what's on the, on the top tension of trying to figure out what's going on in world language right now is we have the presentation and practice method, and then what everybody is trying to move towards and knows is better, which is proficiency style teaching. It comes under many different names like CI, which is not really a method. It's kind of an umbrella of methods. You know, it's a whole thing. But proficiency and standards-based teaching is really where the goal is for world language teachers. Here's the difference. Let's say that we're doing a family unit. And then this is a sample from the summer course that I teach every year for teachers who really wanna dive in deep to this concept of how to take away this feeling. If proficiency is better, why does it feel so dang hard? I teach my students in that course how to make sure that it doesn't feel so hard anymore that you learn that proficiency is actually easier than the traditional methods that we use. And this is one of the examples that I use. Presentation and practice method is what we're traditionally used to. Raise your hand in the comments below if you have been taught this way. This is the way that I was always taught and this is the way that I taught for probably at least three years out of my five-year teaching career. So if I was teaching French one or maybe reviewing in French two, presentation and practice looks like this. You drill and test words for family members in French. And you might do what I know I used to do is I used to do PowerPoints with all of the vocabulary. And I would try and get all those targeted repetitions through doing you know, maybe the PowerPoint every day, maybe switching up the slides so there were different pictures, all those kinds of things, just doing the words over and over again. Mère, père, cousin, cousine, soeur, frère, all those things. Excuse me, y'all, I'm, I'm just really, I'm real toasty. <laughs> the verb être, meaning to be, because you need that to talk about like, she is my sister. Possessives, my, you're gonna need that for the word my. Then you teach students because they're gonna need to talk about age, how to use avoir for age. So then you teach the whole conjugation of to have for age and then show them, I have 18 years, I have 12 years. And the difference between I am 12 years that we use in English or L1, wherever you are watching this from. And then how we would assess is that bottom left corner as we talk about family structures in France. With a family unit in proficiency style teaching, there's 
all different ways that we could do it, but this is just an example, is instead we present our own family tree in French, completely in French. And what our goal is, is we want to make sure that our students understand by the end of that presentation, by the end of class, how everybody in the family tree is related to me. And we are going to use everything in our arsenal to make that speech comprehensible to our students. Visuals, pictures maybe, repetitions, crazy weird diagrams like arrows going here and here, drawings, whatever we need to make sure that students understand, but at all costs, that presentation will be in the target language. And it will also be in really simple target language. It's not gonna be like an entire family history, you know, like Leviticus style. It's gonna be, voici ma mère, elle a, oh God, how old is my mom? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> Maybe she's 57. Désolé, maman. <laughs> Je ne sais pas. But I'm going to say, elle est ma mère. Je suis la fille de ma mère. Elle est ma mère. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make that comprehensible. Then at the end of class, I'm going to check to see if my class can name all my family members. Comment s'appelle ma mère? And they're going to say to me, Deb, like as loud as they can. And they're going to say 57 for how old she is. And they can answer in English. It's no big deal because all I need to know is that they're, they understand that they're responding. Then what I'm going to do is to get some more vocabulary in there is present other families in French speaking countries. And you can do this a couple different ways. You could use authentic texts. Maybe you're going to use some fictional texts that are written for learners, maybe a novel, whatever you want to do. You could make it up. I used to write stories all the time, but the culture is embedded in there because you're using names from the target culture. You, you might be using pictures from the target culture, like whatevs. And then the last thing in a proficiency teaching method for a family unit is that what you're going to do, however you choose to do it, it could be all kinds of things. It could be a portfolio, it could be an IPA, it could be just a speaking quiz, but you test students by their own ability to either understand a description of a family, maybe my own, or to describe their own family in French, depending on what mode you're testing. That's the difference. A presentation in practice, you might have maybe some similar assessment methods. Maybe you still have a speaking assessment that looks like that, but when you look at the ways that students are prepared for that, they don't actually have any tasks in here that's gonna help them achieve that end goal of their ability to describe their family in French. Because this is the major thing that I wanna get across to you in the difference between these two methods is that presentation and practice is not inherently bad. It's just missing a step, really. It's that what we're missing here is that on the left, it's my left, I don't know how it shows up for y'all, but what you're going to see here is that the verb être and possessives and avoir for age, the mistake that a lot of people make with proficiency-oriented instruction is that grammar is evil. It's not evil. It's just that we give it a lot more credit than it deserves. It's the tool. It is not the end goal. So by teaching the verb être and students demonstrating that they understand how to conjugate it, that's cool and all, but... Does that really show that they know how to use it? Not really. So it's not really worth our time to be testing on that portion of it. What we should be doing is seeing is, can they use the verb être in context? Which is where you're gonna see a lot of people butt heads on this issue where they really don't need to. In that a lot of people teach leaning more towards the presentation and practice method, but they use a lot of real world examples. They use a lot of real world tasks. And even though it might not fall under like a CI category or anything, their students are doing real world language. They just are also overloaded with a lot of tools and a lot of assessments geared towards tools, which is, I mean, it's okay. It's a little off balance, but they're still getting where they need to go. 
And then you have on the other side, you know, we won't get on a tangent about this, but lots of methods where um, people believe that they, it needs to be exclusively this type of teaching and that there's no room for any of these extra supplemental tools like learning about possessives, learning about avoir, learning about être, and explicitly explaining things in order to make things move along faster because it might not be um, the most effective method, but honestly, the most effective method is not always the most practical method in your classroom for a lot of reasons, for a lot of reasons. I hope that you've definitely seen that from this year, is that sometimes you also have to come to terms with how much training do you have? What level of challenge are you really ready to take on in this season of your life? How many new things are you really ready to do? And what other demands do you have on your plate in terms of teaching as well as your life? So I have a plan for you that I think is gonna make it a lot easier for you to slowly lean towards proficiency. Presentation and practice, if you were at all like me, you were probably in a situation where you're, you might be mostly in presentation and practice mode still, which are not bad things, it's just, not nearly as effective as proficiency. So you wanna get more towards that other side, right? If you wanna get more towards that other side, here are three ways to make proficiency a part of your everyday routine without all of that friction and frustration that you are probably experiencing. And a lot of that pushback that you might be feeling like, oh God, this is just gonna be too hard. This is just too much time. This is what I did. I did it slowly piece by piece. Lies, full stop lies, I'm gonna call myself on that. At first I tried to do it all at once and it was a full straight up disaster, disaster. So I recommend that you don't do that and do what I did later after I figured out how bad of an idea that was. And I did one of these at a time, mastered it and then moved on to the next one. So I want you to pick one for next year or maybe you could even try it next week if you still got a little bit of time and you think it would work for you that you think you could really start putting into your routine that would make your teaching more effective for next year. Here are three of the easiest ways. I've tried it all. These are the three easiest ways to plan for proficiency. The first thing you can do is keep everything else that you're doing, but every time that you introduce a new concept, make sure that it actually sticks by changing to a CI or proficiency oriented introduction of material. More on that later. Number two, the second thing that you could do, which is way, way, way effective. Like this is a huge power punch, huge power punch, but it's a little bit more of a commitment is practice skills instead of language features. If you have ever asked at some point, or maybe you participated in that survey that I showed that screen share of earlier, and you were one of the people, one of the multitudes of teachers who said, I need to figure out how to teach CI in a CI way while still teaching from a textbook, while still being in a non-proficiency oriented district. Listen, join the club. We've all been there. <laughs> We've all been there. I don't know anybody who hasn't. That's cool. This is the best way to make sure that you are doing this frictionless because you can teach the same thing as your colleagues. You can follow the same format as your book, even though it's not really proficiency oriented, but you could teach in a proficiency way by doing number two. So keep your eyes on number two when it comes to you. And the third one, I think this is the easiest and most time effective thing to do, but I will tell you that energy wise, it's more taxing. So zero prep, it requires zero prep, like maybe five minutes every day. And it also gives you the most bang for your buck, integrating proficiency routines, but it requires consistency and energy to implement every single day because changing any kind of habit or routine is always hard. And students will fight you on this one. So it depends on what you think is gonna work best for you. Okay, you ready? So if you are thinking number one's gonna work for you, Maybe you were like me and you were doing a really outdated method of using vocab PowerPoints, isolated terms, too many at once, all kinds of things. Ditch the vocab PowerPoint and easily teach the same exact vocab list, the same exact concept, the same exact unit. Don't change a thing. You can do that later when you're working on your curriculum. But if you've got zero time, this is a really easy way to instantly switch to proficiency. Teach the same things, but choose a CI novel instead that lines up with your goals. So if you're doing a family unit, 
pick a CI novel that talks about family. One of them is La Madre Perfecta, if you're doing Spanish. I don't remember the author, but I know I did that in Spanish too. My kids liked it. Or maybe a comprehensible story. Maybe you get a comprehensible story on TPT. There's a ton of great authors there. When you come to the conference this summer, you'll meet a lot of great authors who write short comprehensible stories that they could help you with. Or you could do a contextualized vocab presentation. All that means is just like I showed you for the family unit example, instead of presenting family unit terms, you just present your family tree. That is number one. Number two is you could, I wonder if I move this, if it moves it for y'all too, does it? I don't know, we're about to find out. We are about to find out. Number two is do skills instead of language features. So we talked about this example of être in the beginning here, which is to be, so maybe like ser, it really matches up with ser if you're doing Spanish. Instead of doing to be conjugations, include already conjugated forms of to be and only the ones you need, like don't do plural if you don't need them, like just do I am, you are, he is, she is, as the tools for a specific task. For example, ask students, can you describe your family members? What is he or she like? And provide those functional chunks. Provide them over and over and over again in tasks and then ask your student to complete tasks that have to do with using that term. And once you feel like you really hit between 25 and 75 repetitions of it, it'll honestly sink into their heads. They'll get it and they'll be really good at it. Another great way to do this is high frequency verb units. Okay. The key switch here in our minds that we talked about earlier here is for this concept for skills instead of language features is this. The language feature, it's the tool, it's not the end goal. So if we are doing a family unit, learning the verb être is not the goal. The end goal is communication. The end goal is using the verb être in order to express what is, who is and what they are like. And using, all, using that singular verb in a bunch of different forms. This feature is the tool, it's not the end goal. We really have to get this switch on in our brains because a lot of us were taught this way. We were taught that if we knew the verbs then we'd be able to communicate, but it's actually not true. It's scientifically untrue. If you take an SLA course, you will know what I mean. And I've got lots and lots of SLA content on my website if you would like to dive deeper into this. SLA meaning second language acquisition and how all of this works in our brain. But learning how a verb form is conjugated has absolutely nothing to do with whether you can use it or not. It's a totally separate skill and it's actually stored in two different parts of our brains. So communication is gonna live on one side that verb form and how it works lives on the other. So they don't really interplay that much until it's time to really correct our language. Just like a quick little tidbit for you there. So we need to switch our brains to be at the end goal is communication, not to learn how the verb works. It also means that we need to be cool with mistakes. That's another thing, that's another thing. And the last one, which honestly I think is a really good way to go, even though it is gonna take the most energy out of you, it's the best time saver. Number three is proficiency routines. Proficiency routines are the easiest, the most low friction proficiency and curriculum and planning strategy in the books. Here are some of my favorites. This one required zero planning. I used to just come up with these maybe two minutes before the class would walk in the door. Bryce Hesstrom taught me how to do this. You can watch the interview on my website for how, and I can certainly put the link in here for how to do these. And as soon as he mentioned it to me, I started doing it the next week and it changed the way I taught, it was awesome. A password is when you require students to answer a question in the target language before they're allowed to enter your door. It's really cool. So some of the questions that I used to ask my students were things like, quel âge as-tu? Comment s'appelle ta meilleure amie? 
Like what's, what's the name of your best friend? It would be simple things like that. And some people do rejoinders and have song lyrics. You could do all kinds of things, but it's a, it's a quick interpersonal communication check and the students have to understand the question and they have to respond in order to get in the door. And it's actually pretty fun. They hate it for the first two weeks. Trust me, they hate it. That's why I'm saying it does take some gumption on your part in order to keep doing it but it pays off dividends. I used to use them. Also the list of passwords became all of my speaking quizzes. Special person interview is a gem, it's a gem. We won't get into it here because we don't have time today, but there's a lot of content on my website and on my YouTube channel that talks about special person interview. And if you come to the conference, it, we most likely already have a speaker who's gonna do a full presentation on how to do this. And I think you're gonna love it. So make sure that you're there for that. Quick little jive though for a special person interview. What is this? Special person interview is when you ask for volunteers, one person each time to come to the front of the class and be your cute little guinea pig and talk to you in the target language. You coax all of the information out of them by treating them like a special star. You ask them simple questions that an interviewer might ask them like, where are you from? How old are you? What do you like to do? What class are you in? What's your favorite class? What class do you not like? What teacher do you have? What sports do you play? Do you hate sports? Which sports do you hate the most? Those kinds of things. And it's really fun. And it's also a great community builder, huge community builder. You get to know so much about your students because you can ask them whatever you want as long as it's comprehensible. Calendar talk and weekend chats are also, oh, song of the week was my favorite. I used to pick a different target language song of the week and we would pick it apart. We would learn things about it. We would learn things about the artist. It's a ton of target language. It's really great for proficiency as long as you're teaching it in a proficiency style way, which is that you're not, you know, highlighting all of the forms of the verb être and asking students to conjugate them. Like, don't do that. But you can do all kinds of great things with the song of the week. Like you could interpret song lyrics. Something that was my favorite thing to do with song of the week is I would play song lyrics for them and I would take out certain pieces of the song lyrics and they'd have to write in the missing ones like a closed text activity. And we would also do something called storyboarding where they would draw a comic strip of what was happening in the songs to show that they understood it. The next one is calendar talk and weekend chats and those daily classroom routines, like making sure all those are in the target language. Those are really great proficiency routines that you can incorporate into your everyday spiel. And weekend chat was something I did almost every Monday with my class when we remembered and it, we had like a whole set of vocabulary around it and I would just leave terms up on the board so that they could talk about things they liked. You know, on fair weekends, we would leave the terms for fair up there and different things for like rides and roller coaster, and like, you know, like montagne russe and things like that. And another one that you can do is every time that you're going to do some sort of feature based practice, like every time that's planned for your department, maybe you're practicing verb forms for être, you decide, I'm not going to change the content, but I am going to do this in a task based way. So maybe what they have to do instead of some sort of conjugation race or a conjugation review game, you know, whatever you might have on the on the bill for that day is you say, I'm gonna make sure that this is task-based. Every time that we have some sort of feature-based practice, I'm gonna make sure that it's task-based. Instead of doing possessive adjective agreement, I'm gonna make sure that they are only asking the boys these questions and the girls these questions based on whether the gender and number agrees or something along those lines. So you turn it into a task instead of letting it live in a very feature-based world. Another suggestion that I have for you is you can do a CI game every Friday. So I used to set aside time in my French two class when I had a lot of wiggle room and I had a lot of seniors and it was also probably the last French class that they were gonna take. I had so much wiggle room with my curriculum that year. It was awesome. We did CI games every Friday. And it wasn't that our class wasn't rigorous. It's just that I wasn't tied to an assessment or you know, things they had to know for next year. They could just communicate freely and have fun. So we used to do mafia every Friday, which was, I spoke in French the entire class period for 90 minutes. And the kids had so much fun playing this game that they didn't even notice that the bell rang. It was awesome. We used to do it every Friday. And you can do things like that too. There's all kinds of ideas you can do. I know there's, um, there's versions of mafia that are kid appropriate 
Kid Pro Pro. And uh, there's also cool things that you can do, like you can pick up target language games where they can, you know, like play ball games from the target culture. And you can make sure that they know, they probably only need like five or 10 phrases in order to make it work. You could also do card games in the target language. It's great for numbers review and like taking turns, interpersonal understanding, really great. Um, but doing games every Friday is a great routine. And you can also do this if you've got a real tight curriculum, like you could squeeze in 10 to 15 minutes of a game on Fridays. That's definitely doable, definitely doable. And that's a great routine. All right, so we are rolling into the last part of class here. Let's look at our three strategies that we just went over here. The three easiest ways to plan for proficiency are try a proficiency oriented intro of material instead, or maybe try to practice skills instead of language features. Or you could integrate a few proficiency routines into what you're doing. Again, only choose one at a time because trying to do all of them is a disaster. But I will tell you that a lot of the friction that you feel is that proficiency, standards-based teaching, and legacy methods, which is the usually practice presentation. There are some other ones out there, but that's the most common one they're inherently incompatible because they are going towards different goals. It's not that they're, that legacy methods are bad, it's just that you're gonna end up with different outcomes than you will with a proficiency-oriented classroom. And so this is what you'll usually result in, is that you'll have some planning difficulties trying to make them work together. You'll end up with a lot of stress, it takes a lot of time. You'll end up with a lot of department friction coming from trying to make them both happen in order in, to make you know both sides of the bridge come together. and. It, it's all in addition to all the other crazy stresses that you're currently under, especially with the end of the year chaos. So it's not really a great life to live where you're trying to make both of them work at the same time. What I suggest you do is substitute here and there, here and there, here and there. And you can even switch between days. I used to do that too. Planning for proficiency, the end thing here, what I want you to sink in here is that what it really means is that you're not adding things to your plate, but you're instead replacing some of the legacy routines, the presentation and practice things that like other classrooms do, other subjects do, that are really good for their subject, seem to work well for our subject, but actually don't. And try some frictionless CI and proficiency oriented routines that accomplish the same learning target, the same learning goal, but will actually get you there and actually get you there faster. They'll get you there better by targeting the skill instead of just talking about the tools to get you there. All right, so now it's time to wrap this bad boy up. Let's get at them. Put in the comments, what routine do you think makes the most sense for you to adjust next year? You could do this a couple of ways. Think about what punches you in the gut the most is being like, oh, I need to do that the most. That is the worst part of my classroom right now. Or you could go the other path and say, hmm, I could try that. Doesn't sound too hard. Go either way. Go either way. Put it in the comments below and tell me, what do you think? What's going to work the best for you? Introduction of materials, maybe trying something different with that. You can do number two try doing more skills instead of language features? Or three, are you gonna try and incorporate some more routines? Don't put all three of them in there together because I've done it, it's a bad look. I've done it, it's a bad look. I can't wait to see what you write. Now, what's next? While y'all are thinking and while y'all are writing your answers down, <laughs> while y'all are writing in the comments, Make sure that you download this class schedule. You can go to lalibrelanguagelearning.com forward slash Wednesday, and you'll be able to get the whole schedule for what classes we got going on. And make sure that you check out the free curriculum for South Carolina here. This was a project that I participated in, and I don't even remember now, maybe two or three years ago, but it's awesome. It's for K through 12 teachers. It's for all languages that I can feasibly think of as being taught in a school. And it is is completely free skeletons of units with assessments and sample lesson plans, everything that you need to get started and that you could even use tomorrow if you wanted to. And it's all free for you to download. So I wanna make sure that you know about it, that it's out there and that it's awesome. Go to this acronym here, acronym, 
go to this hyperlink here, lalibrelanguagelearning.com forward slash SC. I think the heat is getting to my head. And then make sure, make sure, friends, gathering close, gathering close, save the date. July 19th through 21st, we are at it again for practical and comprehensible. And I need you to be there so that we can beat our old count of 2000 teachers. I think that we can. You win, I'm in. That's what I have for y'all today. Thank you so much for joining me for this. This was like a real power packed class. There, there were a lot of emotions in there. You can tell that I had a, I had a hard time transitioning proficiency. And I just don't want you to go through all the same all the same ish that I did. It was not fun. It can be a lot easier for you. Pick one, one, two, or three. What's a routine or a planning strategy that would make your life a lot easier next year instead of putting proficiency on the back burner every year? This really will be a crucial year to incorporate more proficiency style methods into your year. Not because I think you should, because I know it's going to make your life easier because these methods work better and they get you to your goal faster. Have an amazing rest of your week. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I'll see you next week with another great class. And I know I'll see y'all in July. Catch you later. <laughs>